We know what our goals are. We know what we hope to accomplish. When I walked in for the first time, and I was kind of flabbergasted, I think. Oh, hello there. So glad you could come along. I am the Dream Finder. We're leaving Main Street Station right now, so wave a goodbye. Hey everybody and welcome to this new series on the Main Street Chronicles YouTube channel. What we're doing is we are introducing you guys to Imagineers, former and current, of the Walt Disney Imagineering team. So I've got a couple special friends here with me. I've got Stokes, my co-host from the Main Street Chronicles. What's going on, buddy? Not too much. Really excited to get this new project underway. It's really exciting and we couldn't do it without our jack-of-all-trades... Sam from the Mama Bear Jamboree. Sam, how you doing? Good. How are you guys? Fantastic. We have, and last but not least, we have a former Imagineer. Gilbert Lozano is on with us for our first episode. And everybody, I have got to say, we've been talking to him for the last hour. And he has reinvigorated all of us to make sure that we do this with such passion for you, the listener. So that way you guys can learn more about Imagineering, and also so you guys can get a little peek inside to see what these Imagineers have done to help provide the atmospheres and environments that we love so much. So, Gilbert, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, and I'm quite honored to be here. The honor is all ours. And if bef before we get into the questions, I know we've already talked about a few things, but can you give us a brief overview of what your story is, who you are, and what you did at Walt Disney Imagineering? Well, uh, my title in Imagineering was a senior dimensional designer. And basically what we did is that they gave me a drawing uh, from one of the art directors, and they said, hey, this is the character. We need you to turn this into a sculpture. And so they gave me the drawings. I just put them on my table, and I either in clay or in a block of foam, we would... Um, on model, we would master the, we'd, the, the character, we'd study it, and then start carving into the foam or building up the clay. And that was my, one of my biggest roles there at Imagineering and also as a model maker, uh, creating uh, figures and also creating uh, structures in scale. And it was lots of fun. It was actually a quite enjoyable thing to do, um, especially when the directors came by and they looked at your sculpture, and you were kind of sweating it, you were kind of nervous, you were a little like, oh my goodness, did I do it, did I do it, because you're working by yourself in the corner. And by the way, Imagineering is not a shop, it is a luxury hotel, um, it's, it's a beautiful place to work inside the actual Imagineering sculpting studio and model shop. So when the directors came in and they looked at your project and they and they just said, and, and this happened to me a lot, you know, it's, it's perfect, and I'm not making it up, but they said, they, but then they'd say, oh, could you tweak this a little, but they fell in love with it, and when they did that, there was such a, a, a sense of relief, but also of, of satisfaction that I, I did it, and, and this, is, this project is going to go into the park. It's actually going to be molded and tooled, and then made into a robot, and then it's going to be set in stone, in, in the parks. And that was very exciting for me. It sounds like a really exciting opportunity for anyone that's passionate about, about Disney and bringing things to life. And it's, it's, it's nice that we're, again, we're starting with someone who helped create the concepts before we actually got the physical, tangible things that, that we, that we see in the parks today. And, um, it was actually funny, and, and I was talking with Stokes about this off camera, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but did you guys create the sculptures and then have the latex poured over top so that way that could go over top of the actual mechanics of the auto animatronics? Is that yeah, how it, it works? It, there is a process. You're very close. It, it, we create the original maquettes, the original sculpture, which is, like I said, done in clay or foam, and then it goes into what's called a tooling process. 
Now the tooling process is where uh, a mold is made. So we use silicone if it's going to be a soft mold, and we need a soft mold if the part's going to be hard, but if it's going to be a soft part or if it has to be, if the face on a character has to flex, then you have to have a hard mold, not to confuse anyone, but uh, because silicone is a, is a material we also use not just for the molding process, the silicone rubber, but silicone is also used for the actual product, the actual character himself or herself. It's uh, because the animatronics, the audio animatronics that go underneath have to flex, have to move, the eye blinks and all this stuff. So you have actually a rubber skin. Now, when, uh, when I was at WDI, they were, we were getting into the more projections in the face. It was basically a, a bubble, a plastic bubble that they put a projection inside, which is a different, a different, whole different thing. I prefer the, the actual uh, physical face or, or, or sculpture itself, you know, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so there's a molding process and basically uh, silicone is poured and then over the original, then a hard jacket is made over that and then uh, it's all pulled apart. The, the original sculpture is taken out and then we, we close it all back up again and we either we'll lay up even fiberglass. If it's a fiberglass part, we'll lay up fiberglass or we'll pour silicone into it, very, whichever kind of mold it may be. But um, it's a long process. It's, it takes a very skilled uh, amount of Imagineers to get that done. Uh, every, there's a department for every, we were, and I was in the sculpting studio plus the uh, model shop, but there's also the uh, tooling department and, of course, in the animatronic department as well. Now, what happens after all the process is done, the, there's still a sculpture, what happens to the sculpture after you guys have created the audio animatronic? Well, the sculpture has to be fine-tuned. It has to be painted. It has to be finished. So uh, when the part is pulled, you know, there may be some things that changed a little, like the eyebrows aren't sharp enough. Uh, that was one of my big things uh, that I worked with and uh, that uh, I made the sculpture of um, the Duke of Soul, but his eyebrows had to be sharper. They look sharp in the clay. They look sharp, like it was, but once we pulled it, it's like, well, we got the Duratec, which is a covering for all the fiberglass. It's sandable. And so you have to use tape, and you have to use sand it carefully, and you have to restore the likeness. I mean, it, it's really a high standard. It has to be the character from the Duke of Soul has to be the Duke of Soul from The Little Mermaid. So everything has to be spot on, because you don't want anyone to say, what's wrong with those eyebrows or oh, what's wrong or he looks cross-sided so it has to be polished and fine-tuned and then it goes into the paint department which i don't paint the parts myself but the painters that have done i mean it's it's a it's they make me look like a rock star okay these but i'm going to just say that flat out right i'm the sculptor here but i don't work in a, i don't work in a vacuum i work with with talented talented people imagineers that know their stuff and they're able to pull that sculpture into oh my goodness now it looks like it stepped out of the movie and that's what everyone's good to see and and me being a bronze sculptor fine art bronzes millions of people more have seen my stuff i made for disney than i've sold in a gallery and i'm very proud of that but it's very exciting but anyway so that's 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 the, the final process and then, the, the, of course, you've got the Imagineers, you've got animators uh, who build that incredible robot, which, my goodness, the science behind that is, is beyond my brain function. I, I, I would wake up screaming at night if I had to think as hard as these guys think because they've got to put these mechanical parts together and they got to, the eye blink has to sync with the audio. And, it's, and trust me, Walt did this before there was a lot of computers around. He did this when these guys were doing it with, you know, little screws and nuts and little things that they had to find and they had to build and they had to draw schematics for these things. Um, a lot of it's computerized, so they got a, it's, a, it's, it's been sort of streamlined, but, um, but it still takes a lot of skill and imagination to get it done. Now, I'm, I'm curious. You, you clearly have a passion for art and you clearly have a passion for your trade. What inspired you or what led you to want to become an Imagineer? You know, when you go to the park, when you see you're inspired, I mean, how does this work? 
what on earth? How did, who was behind this that made these pirates come to life? And as an artist, you're like, oh, I got to fit here somewhere. But you know, you're a little kid. I didn't really know I was a sculptor. I thought I was going to be a great painter. But it turned out that I was so much better with sculpture. And I, I said, well, I wonder if they need sculptors at Imaginary. I wonder if, if that's something that, and that's useful. And, and I found out, of course, it is. But I was inspired by what I saw, by, the, by, the, by being taken into a story and moved by, I, you know, it was fun. It was, it's loving. It's, it's, it's just so incredible to, to be immersed in that way. Um, so that's really directed my heart to wanting to be into theme parks into, rather than movies. All my friends were getting into monsters. Everybody wanted to make monsters back then. I don't understand. The ugliest was the better and the most gross. I got to make the grossest monster ever. And I'm like, ah, oh, how can you look at that stuff? It makes me sick. I can't eat lunch. And, and, but, but, you know, when it came to the theme parks, to Disney, it was storytelling. It was, it was living. It was breathing. It was pretty. It was pure. It was strong. Um, and I said, my hand, I, I, I think my hands are, are, are going to be used for something like this, something where you're making families happy. Instead of terrorizing people or, or making them grossed out, you're actually making people feel like they're part of something special. And, and so that, that, that moved me. That, that said, okay, that's, that's the direction I want to go when it comes to um, my art and my talent. And boy, is it rewarding. I'm telling you, I've sculpted many classical sculptures and I've made lots of people happy. But, but it's never as strong as making, when you make people really happy. And it's, I like to say, as, as Aaron Copeland, uh, fanfare for the common man. You know, people who buy fine art bronzes, God bless them. They gave me money, and I, I, but, but it's limited. And they pay a lot of money for them. But it's not really for the common man, in a sense. So when you go to a theme park, when you go to Disney, when you go and you see these characters, everyone, young and old, can enjoy it. And they didn't have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to, to enjoy it. They, they were immersed in a story. They were brought in, and they got memories for life. Is that not, is that not the best thing to think about? That this, these people, all these people come in, and they got memories of the, these rides, but they also got memories of their children throwing ice cream on the ground. But that's okay because they're having fun. And, and, and it's like everyone's having fun. So, so, yeah, I want to be part of that. I'm in. I'm in for that. And when you create the, that environment of magic and fantasy and storytelling, and, and it's for everyone, then you count me in. So that's, that's, that's a big part of it now. I've had, obviously, I've had time to think about that as, as I've gotten older. You know, at first it was just cool and exciting. You know, and I want to be the best I can be. And, and, I, and I worked hard to be the best I can be. So you keep mentioning um, creating these environments and the opportunity to make people happy. What are some of the projects that you've worked on? Um, where could our, where might our listeners have seen your work in the parks? Well, that's a good question. Well, my one of my, it's, you're gonna laugh at this, but it's one of my first project at, at WDI was uh, these large scale forks and spoons, and, and and one was called a slotted spoon. And like, what is a slotted spoon? I've never seen that in my life. And I'm like, oh yeah, you got to make this. And they're giving me these pictures, and they're all French drawings or French. Drawings from the like the 1800s, and I'm like, oh, that's really beautiful silverware. And you want, oh, you want me to make this? How big? Six feet tall? Uh, okay. Um, gosh, what is this? And 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 like I said, I didn't know what a slotted spoon was, so I had to go research that out. Um, but um, you know what they told me it was for? You're not gonna believe this. This was, oh my goodness, my heart was racing and my face just lit up. It was for. The Ratatouille ride in France, in Ferris, France. It's a dining experience. So you get off the ride, and there, there's a restaurant there, right? And so after your food, your stomach settles. <laughs> they got this amazing restaurant, and guess what? You're all mouse size. So the plates are big, the, uh, the forks and spoons are big, and I had to do a bottle cap, which was a, a three. It was a two and a half foot diameter, and. And there was the okay, so there was the Christmas lights hanging over, and it's it's gorgeous. 
And the, the, God bless the Imagineers who came up with that, con the art directors, the designers. It's beautiful. And so I'm looking at these things. So when I found out that, it was like, oh, my goodness, so many people are going to see this. But it was more than that. It was like it was not just a fork and a spoon. It's not just a bottle cap. It's something that people are going to interact with. In fact, if you look online, if you go and check out that restaurant, Gustav, Gusto's, um, you'll see that everybody sits next to one. Everyone sits next to a fork. There's a, the, 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 they're, they're kind of mounted on top of the, the bottle caps. Um, and some are hanging on the wall. And, and when you see that, I mean, these people are going to have this dining experience. They're all mouse size. And they're going to, I made those forks and spoons. I made that bottle cap. And that's like, that meant a lot to me. So it's, you see how that, that sculpture came to life immediately after. It's like, wow, it's not just a fork. It's not just a spoon. It's not just some bottle caps. It's actually something kids are going to, you know, lean against or whatever. Just, oh, look at up a mouse. I, I, you know, that kind of thing, you know, it's. Uh, so that was very exciting. Um, I like to mention the also, the, of course, the uh, Little Mermaid ride, which was amazing. I did a lot of characters with a Little Mermaid. I, I was in charge of the, I was lead sculptor on that, and I was um, Flotsam and Jetsam were given to me, the Duke of Soul, the Carp with Harp, and Carmen Miranda and Flounder. Those were my characters. Now, for Larry Nikolai, he was lead art director for this project, and Working with him was, was like a seven years, eight years of college. Because what I learned from him and how he thinks and how he strategized, he looked at my flounder and he says, okay, Gilbert, his face is a little squished. You got to bring it out a little more. It, it, he was right. And I didn't see it. Like, yeah, you're right. His face is a little pushed in. Um, he taught me Disney characters. But you go into this ride now. And you see these characters dancing and singing. And, oh my goodness, to, to even think that I was part of this. And the kids are pointing, flashing, the kid, taking pictures everywhere. And you hear the music, you know, under the sea, under the sea. <laughs> I love it. I'm sorry. I, I love The Little Mermaid. Um, but uh, it, it was exciting. Oh, by the way. <clears throat> To get the job, I had to show them that I, if I was Disney savvy. So I sculpted Ariel in foam. And I, uh, it's just about um, maybe three and a half feet tall. And I, I showed it to Larry. And I said, Larry, what do you think of this? What do you think of this uh, Ariel? Did I, did I get close? And he looked at it and he says, Gilbert, I know how good you are. You don't have to show me, but... This is beautiful. And he started taking pictures. It was pretty amazing. And, and um, uh, it was just something I felt so proud of. And because, like I said, I, I, like I, I do like Ariel. She's one of my favorite princesses, I guess. You know, I guess I like seafood, too. But I, I don't know if I should put those two together. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but yeah, that was, a big, that was a big project that I really, really enjoyed. Um, uh, another one was uh, Figaro. And Figaro is a... He sits in Fantasy Fair, and you can get your picture taken under him. Uh, it's right next to the carousel, and it's, uh, he's an animatronic cat. And what he does, I had to design that, by the way. I got the pictures, but I had to design how he was going to move. And that was tricky, because he's supposed to be sleeping, and then the little bluebird's going to wake him up, and he's going to wake up. And he has, so his head has to lift, his, his, his eyes have to open, eye blink, so we have eye blink. He has mouth movements, I had to figure that out. Here's the tricky part, my friend. He wasn't going to be a silicone head. He was going to be a hard plastic head. So now we got to think puppet. He has to have trap doors. He has his eye blinks have to, everything has to be designed like a, like a marionette. And so that makes it harder, actually. Now, if it had been silicone, you just do the sculpture and it flexes under the, under the animatronics. Does that make sense? So Absolutely. Under the, so, yeah, so, it's a ta so basically the silicone skin is attached to the, uh, the robot with magnets or with Velcro. Uh, if it's outside, it's magnets. Anyway, and I was on my own. No one said, we want you to do it this way. You have to do it that way. No, they said, you're the Imagineer. You're going to figure this out. And, and I said, I can do it. And of course, I took a big swallow when I said that. And I said, okay, <laughs> I'm going to do this. <clears throat> so I walk away. 
I'm looking at this picture. I'm looking at how I'm going to engineer this. So what I'm getting is, okay, marionette. And so we've got to think of the trap door and the eye blink, like I mentioned. So Figaro is sleeping. He had to raise his head up, and he had a paw movement. So his paw had, had to move as well. And he had a tail movement, but they, they omitted that one later. I think it just, um, I don't know. But anyway, so what I did is um, in foam, it was all carved in six-pound urethane foam. I created the sculpture, and then I created the, uh, I had to cut it all apart, empty out the head, you know, there are limbs everywhere. I had to make the eyeballs and then the, the pivot points for the eye blink inside the foam head. It all had to be proof of concept. It all had to work before it gets tooled. Otherwise, it won't work. So I assembled all the parts back all after sculpting everything. I assembled it all. I demonstrate to the directors that this is functional. Look, at, this is how his head raises. He's sleeping. He's purring. Now he's raising his head. He's looking at figure. He's looking at the little bluebird in the cage, and now he's he's moving his paw. All this had to, I had to do this manually because there's no robot inside. I'm the sculptor. I know nothing about robots, but I had to. I had to know about pivot points. I had to, the rods are gonna go. I had to design the balcony he sits on so that enough room was on that that they could put the, um, the extra components that he needed. Um, very challenging but very exciting, especially when you go see it. And, and you can even find it on YouTube, which is really exciting. And he looks wonderful at night. They're playing Renaissance music in that. So you're, I'm looking at, and I'm a cat man. I didn't mention that before. I'm a cat man. I, uh, I love cats. It was a big, big, big moment for me to do Figaro. And I felt kind of um, a little guilty. The reason I was guilty was because they had Imagineers who had been there a lot longer than me. And in fact, my, uh, my Emilia Loza, a wonderful, talented sculptor, he sculpted the little bluebird next to him. He was at Disney a lot longer than me. And if that wasn't an act of God, I don't know what was, because I was so amazed that I was so privileged to get Figaro, a top line character. And, um, and what a moment that was for me. And now everyone gets to enjoy him at the parks. I think he's still there. We were going to put fur on him at first, and I said, uh, not out he's outside, he's an outside figure. So, so you can't put fur on something outside because I look like a wet cat. <laughs> we, did, we did want that. <laughs> so I was very proud of that. Now, what would you say is your proudest moment of being an Imagineer? Would it be Figaro, or would it be something else that you guys worked on? It was something else, definitely. And uh, my proudest moment, but I, I think I almost got... Um, I say this with love and caring and, and, and jocularity uh, that uh, the Dave Bosser, who was in charge of all the uh, uh, Imagineers at that time, goes out in the shop and he, uh, he says, who made this Yeznid, the Fantasia wizard? Now, this wizard was designed for Carousel in Shanghai Disney. There's a big uh, Josh Stedman designed that Carousel and uh, did a beautiful job. But my part was to do uh, uh, Yezni and also um, uh, Bacchus. And so, uh, anyway, I made, I sculpt, I've never sculpted him before. I have, I have no, uh, I, I, it was just a new character for me. I just I did, I wasn't really familiar with him. So I, I, I sculpted him out, and they presented it, and, and Dave Boster saw it. How he saw it, I don't know, because he's so high up there. <laughs> it's like, oh, my goodness. This guy descended down to see my sculpture. I was, no, he's a wonderful man. But I'm just saying, he was just one of the top guys. He goes out in the shop, and apparently they gave him a copy of this maquette that I made. Now, what we did that back then is we, got, we made the maquette. But he was about eight inches tall, just the head, just the portrait head with his hat. And um, he was... Um, he was uh, basically for scanning. So they're going to scan him to three feet tall. And I got to work on the final piece as well. Anyway, it turned out they gave him one. I'm thinking, why did they give him one? Well, they said, well, yeah, he really liked it. He really liked it? Really? Dave Boston really liked my, my yes man? Oh, that's really, yeah, we had, to, we had to make him a copy because he wanted one for his office. And I go, oh, wow, that's, that's nice. That's interesting. And so later on, he comes out into the Imagineers or all standing around. And he goes, this Yesnit that, that, that was made here, 
is the best one I've ever seen come out of this shop. And because I'm a new guy, in a sense, I'm not really, I haven't, I haven't been in, I wasn't there 20 years at all. But it was a blessing and a curse. <laughs> it was so wonderful that this guy loved that sculpture so much. But it was also scary because all the other sculptors are looking at me. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, I'm sure you didn't mean that. I'm sure you guys have made better ones before. This is, just happens to be the latest and the greatest for now. You know. But, but they, they were very sweet. No one got mad. But, but I was very proud, very excited. It was a big moment for me, and it was made special for me. And I felt that this was a time, not out of pride arrogance, but out of pride accomplishment and excitement. It was like God put me in a place at a time for this. And in, I didn't go into my life history, and I won't, but, but for me to rise to this moment, to be with these wonderful people, these amazing talent imagineers who all went through all kinds of amazing schools, and you're looking at a high school graduate who had a set of skills. But for me to make it to that place in that moment, that they're relying on me to do all this was a big moment a big moment for me. And I thank God for that moment because I know it had to be an act of God for me to go, to rise to such a high place in such a short time. And um, so that was a big moment. And I took, I shook his hand, you know, you don't always get those moments, but that was one, that was definitely one moment then. There's one regret in my life that I have today, and I'm going to put it on audio, is that I left Shanghai too soon. I should have, they wanted me there a little longer. But I came home because um, of personal issues, family and so, so forth. But I had to come home. And, um, it, but leaving Shanghai Resort was, was heartbreaking. But uh, working with Josh, okay, here's the thing. Here's what happened. Okay, we had sculptures, uh, and they were done by Patrick Simmons and um, Bruce Lau, two amazing, awesome sculptors. They sculpted the maquette of uh, Rapunzel. And, and Flynn, when they scanned them, they made their heads too big. Somebody might have said, let's give their heads 25% bigger or something. And so they had these big bobbleheads on these characters. We need a sculptor here now. Gilbert Lozano, can you go to Shanghai and fix these sculptors? Sculpt we got to get them back. And by the way, Ariel, the same problem happened. Um, you see, this is Ariel's Grotto, is the, is the ride we worked, I worked on, plus the uh, carousel, but that was Josh, that was his responsibility. And um, anyway, <laughs> so I go in there, I fly, oh my goodness, I've never been on a plane to, to the Far East, that was awesome. I will never forget that they, they served me this wonderful chicken salad, Disney sent me business class, and then they put me in a five-star Four Seasons Hotel, talk about luxury. Anyway, so at the plane, they give me this chicken salad, and it's immaculate. Would you like another glass of wine, Mr. Lozano? Uh, oh, sure, no, I think this is enough. Thank you, whatever. So I eat the salad. It was wonderful. And, and I was satisfied. I was happy, right? And then they come out. Here's your steak, Mr. Lozano. And it's a freaking steak the size of my face. And I'm thinking, wait, I just, no, no, I already ate. No, no, so that was just the appetizer. This is for you. This is your, this is your dinner. So that was hilarious. All right, back to the story. So I go back, so we're, we're, we're the, the sculptures of Flynn, Rapunzel, and, and the Little Mermaid. We'll keep the Little Mermaid on the side, but um, I had to fix them. I had to bring them all back to scale. The heads were way too large. Now they needed a portrait sculptor to do this. I'm a portrait sculptor, thank you very much. I'm very good at portraits, that's my specialty. So they needed me to, literally, I had to shrink these foam heads down and not lose the character. Keep the integrity of these characters. No pressure, right? Because if you, sh if, you sh if you start carving in one place and not the other, you made an imbalance. If you make that nose too small, you messed up the whole piece. They'll have to make another one. You can't now, put it back. You can't put it back. Yep. Now there's tricks, but you know, uh, I was trying to do it first time off the bat. So I sculpted Rapunzel. She has a beautiful face. And I said, I don't want to lose this face. So instead of, they didn't remill it. They could have, but they got me instead. So they didn't have to. So anyway, I got her face down to the scale, 
And I kept that glorious a smile that Bruce Lau put on her. And I made sure that she was just as gorgeous as he sculpted her. And, I, and so they, were, they loved it. They fell in love. Now, Flynn, on the other hand, he was a little tricky. I'm like, okay. I'm better with female faces. I don't know why. It just is. That's who I am. I'm sorry. That's what I do. But I'm looking at Flynn, and I'm thinking, okay, it starts carving. I said, I need a model for this because... Some of it was very plain and simplistic. I need someone to look at to help me with these, the avillary folds or the brow. And I said, who have I seen around here who's handsome? Oh, Josh, he's handsome. I'll bring him down here. Josh, come down. And so I had Josh model for me. He helped me with structure. And I think he was happy. I think he was happy about that. We got it down to, it was beautiful. They loved it. It's Flynn. But there might be a little Josh in there. So make sure you tell, say that was another proud moment, moment in my career here with Disney was using Josh Steadman as a model. He sent me a picture later when I came back uh, to the States that, uh, of him standing next to Flynn, so him face to face, right? So that was pretty awesome. That was awesome. That was an awesome moment with Josh. And we're, we're, I still follow him on Instagram, uh, kind of follow his career. I'm um, hoping we get a chance to work together at some time, at some point. We'll see what happens. It's a still a big world. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ready to retire. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still holding in there. <laughs> um, I might be a renaissance man. I don't know computers, but I still have, some, I still have a truckload of tools that I know how to use. And um, I can still pull it off. I'm still, that's where I'm at. Uh, okay, so I think back to you talking about your work on the Figaro figure and how you had to troubleshoot your own challenges with that. Uh, a lot of the Imagineers we've looked at with this season of the Main Street Chronicles are Walt's original Imagineers, where he was pulling them straight from the studio and saying, I know you're used to being a artist for films or TV, cartoons, things like that, but I want you to come build these parks for me. And they have to troubleshoot it and kind of teach themselves on the fly. Um, so what do you, what are some of the, I guess, best characteristics for an Imagineer in your opinion? You gotta think quick. You gotta be able to problem solve, not panic. You know, hold yourself, hold your mind together. Say, I'm not here for no reason. They got me here for a reason. You have to troubleshoot fast. And look, I'm a guy who makes a lot of mistakes, believe it or not. But you know how I got really good? I know how to fix my mistakes. I know how to turn them back and say, okay, I, I messed up here, but I can turn around. I, I can turn this around and I can make it right. And no one will know the difference. And that's how I, a lot of my career is based on that. <laughs> but I, I, I regret not having a college degree. So I want to tell everyone college is good, especially in the arts um, and, and, and engineering. But but yes, uh, problem solving is a, immediately is 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 extremely important. And you got to be quick. You don't let yourself get scared. Don't start breathing heavy. Don't start sweating it. You look at the project before you, and you realize this has a solution. Nothing is impossible. If God could create the universe out of the thoughts, the galaxies, the beauty, you look at the stars, and there's just Nothing's impossible for him. But so how can anything be impossible for us? So you look at any man-made challenge and it's like, oh, it's just a toy. God looks at that like crayons, if that makes sense. You know, oh, you know, all the kids are playing with crayons again. I love my kids. I love the colors they make. So basically, if you have an attitude like that, and now that's, that, that's based obviously on my relationship with God and what I believe, and, and, but it's always pulled me through. He's always gotten me through. And so I said, Lord, this is crayons to you. This is not impossible. And he pulled me out every time. And I got it done. And so, so that, that was, that's my little secret, I don't want to say weapon, but my little secret power, if you say. But, but like I said, you got to be sharp. You got you to gotta know the problem. Some people are really gifted with this. What's the, what's the gentleman's name who designed the California soaring um, mechanics? Do you remember him? I, he, he, he went home. They didn't, know how to fix, they didn't know how to do this California soaring ride. He goes home. He sees his kids' erector sets. And he, he puts something together. And he says, that's it. 
that's the ride. And he engineered the whole ride at home, took it to the uh, took it back to the to WDI. Says here's the, and they're looking at it with all with their mouths on the their jaws on the desk, saying, "Uh, yeah, that's gonna work." You see how individuals are important, and how individuals matter. And I'm not saying collaboration is bad. Of course not. Obviously, collaboration is wonderful. It's important. We need it. But there's a place never to be forgotten about the individual visionary, the individual dreamer, the individual who can create and, and going in a pile of toys and saying, I can make this happen. Or looking at an animatronic Figaro and saying, this has to work. This cat has to work. And individuals are important. So we never should move away from that. We should always remember it's okay to listen to somebody, but when you see that sparkle in their eye or that dream in their heart, it comes from the heart. That's what I should have said. That's stronger from the heart. I can follow a person like that, man or woman. I can follow a person like that and say, I see it. I see it in your heart. I see the power in your heart. I elaborated a little bit, Stokes, on your question. I'm sorry. I kind of meandered, but it kind of connected a little because it's where it stems from, where, where great achievements come from. You know, where you're faced with something impossible. And what I was trying to say is that nothing is impossible. It really isn't. And I'm living proof of that. I Trust me, I've been in things that I have to do this. I've got to figure this out. And I don't have, the, I, I might not have had the resources I needed. I couldn't tap the shoulder of another, another Imagineer and said, because he's working on his project, or this other sculptor and say, Hey, could you help me with this? I, I can't quite get this jaw movement right. Could you uh, uh, help me figure it out? I couldn't do that because he, his load is full. He has a full load. To, he has his own things to figure out. And, and, you know, instead of having a committee figure out this engineering of a cat, let's give it to the artist. And you know something? That was the way to do it. Because what they got is what they wanted. They got an animatronic Figaro that looks just like Figaro, but works exactly the way they want. And very, we're happy with it. And trust me, I didn't have a computer to help me figure that out. And it was, it was like those bootstraps, you know, that, that rugged tenacity. I, I like it. There's a lot of fun words you could use but for this. But, but to me, that's American as well, right? <laughs> that's, that's what makes us a part of history. That's what makes it special. Each and all of the everyone who's listening now is very special. And, and, and it's when you find it, when you find out what you're special at. And it can be, it, it can be a lot of things. And, uh, but, uh, boy, when you find it, you're like, oh, my goodness, I was born for this. Anyway, that's my thought. You touched on the uh, ingenuity of Imagineers and how they can look at things that aren't part of their project and then use them to build like the mechanics. So you were just talking about Mark Sumner and Mark, the, Mark Sumner. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mark Sumner you and uh, <laughs> the Soren with the Erector set. And was it Bob Gurr who did the apple when it was spinning on the table, right guys? Yep. And that was how they came up with the Omni Movier design. So mm, mm. I think Imagineers look at everyday things in a different way. Mm -hmm. They're always looking at how things are working in real life and seeing how they can apply that to their projects. Absolutely right, Sam. Absolutely right. In fact, that was my education. That was my college. You know, I would look at how a tree, how does a tree grow? How does it change? How do the leaves change season? You know, how do lizards walk? What do the scales look like? Well, the eye blink on any animal, you know, lions roar, the teeth. It was creation that made me good. It was studying what was made that made me excellent. And today, I am excellent because of that. Not because I, now, trust me, I would have liked, it would have been nice to have a professor teach me. A lot I had to learn on my own. But, but I did have a teacher, didn't I? It was, it was God's creation, wasn't it? It was what you just said, Sam. We have to look at what's been made, what's, what's in front of our eyes on a daily basis. You know, I live in Arizona now, <clears throat> for now. And um, there's these crane flies. And I said to myself, I'm not going to kill this crane fly just because he came in my house. Look at how magnificent he is. And I said, nobody on earth can make one of these. You know, 
Now, no offense to the who believe this came out of nowhere, but I'm not going to go there. But I'm looking at this crane fly, and I could say, okay, I'm going to talk to it. Can you make one of these? It's like, no, I can't. Actually, this is pretty difficult, especially at this size. I guess I just said think, nothing's impossible, but we can get close on this one. So I let him out because he, he, didn't, he didn't deserve to die because he's a beautiful, remarkable creature created in a mar remarkable way. And he has a remarkable function like all of us do. And um, so I let you know. So, so yeah, Sam, to answer your question simply is, is that, yes, we have to observe the world. The greatest scientist, Isaac Newton, uh, one, of, one of our greatest, in this, you know, was, a, was a strong believer in God, but he, that was his source. That was his source of, of uh, idea, how he got his ideas. And, uh, but we do have to observe creation we have to keep our eyes open because there's still more. There's still more to see. Anyway, that's my thought on that. <laughs> We're just scratching the surface here, and we've heard about your work with Disney. Now we'd like to hear about your other work. We know you've worked with Garner Holt, who we're looking forward to having on later this season. And we know you've done some work for Universal. I'm most excited to hear about your zoo work. Give us a 15,000-foot view of everything Gilbert Lozano has done so far. Well, you know something, it's funny you said zoo stuff. I actually really love zoo stuff because it's creating homes, habitats for creatures in our world that need to be protected, that need to be safeguarded, and making them the most luxurious pad you can make, you know, with, with some, something that any um, cougar wants to live in, right? I want to live here because it's so cool. It got the waterfall, it got the pond. I, my uh, design, I, I mentioned the snow leopard. Uh, it's called the Snow Leopard Leap in uh, Louisville Zoo, and uh, I had to sculpt a, a model that looked exactly like Afghanistan, where they're from. But this, it was called, the, it, because it's a Snow Leopard Leap, there has to be places for the leopard to leap. So they give you CAD drawings, and then you have to translate those CAD drawings into something realistic. And so, so I carved these rocks, and it made sure it looked like their habitat. It is a joy for me to do that, because... Um, not only like theme parks take care of, of the people, but zoos take care of creation, our animal, our animal ambassadors, as they call them. And there's a great joy in that because back, you know, look a hundred years ago, these, they were in cages. They were iron bar cages, for goodness sakes, get them out of the cage. But, uh, but creating a home that looks real and, and, uh, and aquariums too. I've designed, I, I've created create aquariums as well. Um, and this is where a lot, I just mentioned where um, a lot of my education came from. I had to learn. They said, Gilbert, make us a chuckwalla. And I'm like, oh gosh, I've never seen a chuckwalla in my life. I think it's a lizard, right? Yep. <laughs> so, like, so, you know, you start looking at, at chuckwallas and what they do and you start seeing how they expand. And, and I had to sculpt, I had to make this for the zoo, the sea anemones. One of my very first creations in my career, this is going back a long time, it wore sea anemones. These are for aquariums uh, internationally. And um, the sea anemone has a bunch of little fingers. You know, where the clownfish go in, you've seen those? Oh, yeah. Uh, those, are, those, are, those are the big ones, but there's also the small ones. I had to develop these. They had to mold. They, they didn't know how to do it. So we, uh, they, And the sculptures they weren't looking right that they were making, so they gave it to me. And I was working for a company called uh, David L. Manwar Corporation, who, who builds habitats for uh, zoos. So I was their sculptor and their mold maker, and I had to develop a way to create these anemones. And we got it, we got it. It came out beautiful. We used uh, we used flex um, urethane, so they're kind of semi-translucent, uh, translucent, and you can light them up. We put them in the aquarium, and they look gorgeous. Um, Pretty amazing stuff, and, and I, one thing exciting, another just a segue back to Disney is that later I found out that David Alman Warren sold Disney a lot of the corals I made for him. Twenty it was it twenty over twenty years ago, and they put wow. him in the ride, the Finding Nemo ride. So we're I'm we're going through the ride. I'm loving it. My wife goes, Gilbert, and I go what? Did you make that? And I'm, no, I didn't make anything for here. This is this is you know this wasn't my project. And she goes, "No, you made that." And so I look out the I look a closer look at the window, and I'm like, "Oh my goodness, it's those sea anemones again!" And they're all over the place. And, and, oh, that's and it, awesome. I, it was I mean, there's some corals there that I made and molded, and and it was pretty awesome. But 
But yeah, I started my my career started as a as a as a uh, in zoos and aquariums and, and uh, museums. Did a lot of museum work as well. And there's a higher standard because. People have to, it has to look real. You know, when you sculpt an otter, it has to look like an otter. It can't look like a cartoon. It has to look like something cute and playful. And that's what I did. Um, so that, so yeah, my a strong, um, basically I went into my career like I had, you know, 10 years of education already. I had to make them believe that I was, oh, I'm already educated. I know how to do this. I had a high school degree. I have a high school diploma. How I got, how I graduated, I don't know. It was a miracle, another miracle by God. But uh, every project I was ever given never failed. You should have seen the holler monkeys I made for Lisbon, Portugal. It was called the Temple of the City. It's a food court, and they had rainforest. And this rainforest theme is uh, based on all the toucans, holler monkeys, macaws. So I had to create all that, and. And I did, and 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 all actual size, and but so I have a strong connection with uh, with his natural uh, creation, natural animals, and but the boy did that cross over well into Disney, you know, because Disney was a oh I got to confess something too, gosh this this is a live confession, oh my goodness, but uh, I'm going to say this, um, I had never sculpted a cartoon before in my life or even drawn a cartoon in my life because I, I was always a realistic guy. You know, I was just, you have to make it more realistic. It doesn't look right. If, it did, if, that, if that portrait of Abraham Lincoln I made did not look like him, I was, it was upsetting. So, so I focused more on the realism and I knew nothing about cartooning. There's a strong benefit that I learned about cartooning. Cartooning stretches and flexes and pulls and crunches up. It's fun. I never knew. And I sculpted this. Um, uh, no, I never sculpted anything cartoony. I was going to say, I was thinking of something I sculpted that was close, but no. Anyway, I had to tell Disney. Disney had to take me as I am. And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, they looking at these Disney characters. And I'm like, oh, gosh. I think it's simple, but it wasn't simple. Why wasn't it simple? Because there's a standard to them. Disney characters have certain arches, certain angles. Valerie Edwards. Okay, back into I'm going to get back into this, Adam, Brian, for a moment. Absolutely. Valerie Edwards. She's a sweetheart. I, 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 she. They told me, oh, she's very strict. Oh, she's very perfectionist. Oh, Gilbert, you better be ready. She's going to come look at your Nigel puppet. I was sculpting a Nigel for a traveling show for Disney. It was a uh, he danced. He was he sang and he had. A, a team of dancers come out. It was like basically they got a bus and they turned it into a Finding Nemo submarine. Really cool, actually. They got a ticket and then they had to um, put it in storage in Anaheim. <laughs> Can you believe it? it was pulled over because the police didn't figure out, couldn't figure out, is it a bus? What is this? You're not supposed to be driving this on the street. Anyway, that's a true story. So what happened is I, had to, I was in charge of this. I, w I was in charge of Nigel, a full-size Nigel. It was about three feet tall. She was the art director, so was Larry on that. They came to Garner Holt, and they're going to evaluate my work. So everybody's telling me she's terrible. Uh, you know, I, I don't listen to everybody. When, it's, when someone says someone's terrible, I usually don't listen to them. Until, it's like, no, let them prove it to me first. <laughs> let the person prove it. <laughs> so I was shaking. I was shaking. And here she is, the top sculptor at Disney for, how, I don't know, 30 years, 20 years, something like that. Anyway walks in my uh, sculpting studio and she's looking at this, and I'm trembling I mean my hands are trembling and, and she's looking at it and they're all there's about 10 directors there or something like that maybe a hundred I don't know I couldn't see straight I was so scared <laughs> I don't know why I was scared I never did this anyway the point is she's standing right next to me and she's shaking her head up and down up and down is good and she's looking at it and she told me about angles she says just Make sure you get your angles. That's what's important. She, so she taught me about angles. But before she said that, my, I was trying to show her something. And I have my sculpting tool in my hand. And it's trembling like this. I, well, you can't see this. But my hands are shaking right now with a sculpting tool in my hand. And I literally had to put it against the sculpture so I could stop trembling. She saw that. You know what she did? 
she stood like, arm to arm close to me. And at that moment, she calmed my heart. And I wasn't scared. It was like, there's a human being right here. And she's concerned about my sculpture. And she cares about what I'm doing. And she's liking what she's seeing. That was a moment for me that I'll never forget as well. But it was the importance of that question about, you know, there is a design to Disney um, characters. I didn't know anything about it. I was new. I, I didn't. Everything was from a museum or an aquarium or a zoo. I had just started working for Garner as his portrait sculptor. I, that's what I sculpted Marlon Perkins uh, for Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Now, I sculpted that in my own studio, and then he liked it so much that he hired me, um, gave me a job. But cartoons were, were foreign to me. Cartoons were foreign to me, but I had good teachers, and Valerie Edwards is definitely one of them. And Larry Nikolai, which I sent him a, a link. I'm hoping he gets on with you guys because he's another great mentor of mine for Disney. And he, was, he used to work for uh, Hanna-Barbera. And, um, wow. And yeah, he very cool. Very, very cool. Have, he's the genuine article, my friend. He is the real guy. And he's, he taught me I'm good because of these people. I'm, I can be a good animator. I understand animation now. Uh, maybe not draw it as much, but, but if I was to create it in 3D, I have the knowledge now because of these good people um, who, who ingrained it in me. And I, but I didn't know, that's how I got in WDI too. That was another thing. It's like, wait, how, how did I work? How did I get directly to, to WDI? I got in because Garner Holt had slowed down and unfortunately had to let some people go. And unfortunately, I was one of them. <laughs> and I called up Larry and I said, Larry, remember you were my art director. You were my great mentor. And is there any possibility I can get into WDI? I think it was like less than two weeks. He got me in. We had built up a relationship. And this will help young people to know that if you're working in a company that's not directly Disney, you could uh, get to know Disney people and work well and they'll remember you they'll remember you especially if you're if you lose your job it's like and they got work we need you I, we worked with you before we know who you are and uh, that's what larry did for me so he actually started my official career at wdi so that's interesting would you have any other advice that you would give to potential imagineers internships are important education of course is important to know what your heart wants number one want to get in movies Okay, if you like entertainment, okay, if you want to be movies, you want to be theme parks. Which one brings you more joy? And you have to remember, you want to be an imaginary. Okay, awesome. I'm so happy to hear it. What do you need to know as an imaginary? All right. You could talk to imagineers. How Disney does actually offer internships, moments with imagineers that you can actually interact with them and talk to them. And say, hey, that's, this is definitely for me. Or maybe this is not for me. Maybe I'd rather go into more video games. So number one, you decide in your heart what you really want to do. And what we talked about today, I mentioned you know, uh, creating passionate places for people to visit for, um, for lifetime memories. A movie goes on the shelf and you might watch it again maybe three times for the rest of your life, if you really like the movie. Maybe more, if you really like it. But it ends up on the shelf. And everybody remembers what a great movie it was. And yet you could say, I was part of that movie. But guess what? People today, this moment, are still getting their picture taken in front of Figaro. They're still eating at the Ratatouille ride. They're still going through the Little Mermaid. And we worked on Cars, too. And when I worked on Cars at La Cars Land, which is awesome, by the way. That was oh, you just, you just lit my eyes up. I don't know if you saw it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I I cried when I walked down and well I'll digress a little bit. They Please. I was in um I was in California for a job that I no longer have. Um our corporate headquarters was right down the road from Disneyland and was there for three days. And I was like, I'm four miles away from Disneyland. I've gotta go. So <laughs> I got an awesome. Uber. Four miles took me like two hours to get there in the <laughs> Southern California, <laughs> the California, Southern California board. traffic. And we're riding down the road and 
the Uber driver was a retired Disney music producer. <laughs> and I'm like, and he's giving me all these inside tips. And I wasn't as big of a Disney fan as I am now. This was six, seven years ago. And he he's like, well, this is what you got to do. This is what you got to do. And so I get there. I step on Main Street and I just ball like a baby. And I'm like, this is it. This is it. Well, the next wow. day I was like, well, I'm going to go again, but I'm going to go to DCA because I've got to go see Cars Land. I go to buy a ticket and I only had like two hours. And she was like, hey, here you go. I was like, I. And then she's like, oh, honey, you know, it's closing in like an hour. I was like, huh? So she (laughs) called her, she called her manager over. And this was before I knew of Disney magic or cast members going above and beyond. And she was like, here's a ticket. Go enjoy it. Have as many memories as you can. Wow. You've got an hour. Go. (laughs) She was like, she was like, run, just run. And I bypassed everything, went right to Radiator Springs and the neons were on, and I just stood there, and I, grown man, weeping because my I was in my favorite movie, and it, it was just unbelievable. So thank you. That's a wonderful <laughs> story, by the way. And by the way, I cry a lot too. So so, so you're not alone. <laughs> I'm emotionally moved a lot. So we'll just say it that way. How's that? There you go. That's a good way of saying it. Well, that's it what I'm going to say from now on. That uh, the shop looked like uh, like a like a, we were working on that bride. It looked like. Uh, like a what you call Firestone or like a track auto or something. It looked like a like a car repair shop. Right. You know, it was funny because these are a bunch of car parts around with big eyes. Um, it's one of my favorite rides. It's a masterpiece, actually. I guess it's especially at night. If you saw it at night, you got the full full show because it's gorgeous. How the rocks are done, and that was done differently. That was done. Um, uh, they they use computer panels. Uh, for that and then they engineered it piece by piece and maybe you know that already but it was really interesting how they did that ride but they did build an actual model which was gorgeous Uh, i just worked on the cars but i didn't work on the model itself that would have been awesome i love models i'm a model guy now our fans know i'm not a huge fan of ips but they really made it work with cars land and radiator springs what are your thoughts on ips being implemented into the parks when disney goes a little too far out into an IP that we can't, it's not part of our world. It's not part of our story. The, the attraction's always stronger when it's part of us, not when we're trying to be part of them. Now look, okay, I will mention an IP, okay, Avatar. Avatar was a beautiful, colorful movie, and the characters were amazing, and the P, everything was amazing. But there were some scenes in the film that were so disturbing and so upsetting. And it's like, I don't want to be part of this world because Walt, being a humanist, he believed in a bright and strong future for all humanity, the world, everyone. We're going to have this tomorrow land. We're going to go into space and we're going to see all these amazing things and discoveries. Walt's vision for the future was like Gene Roddenberry's in a sense, where Star Trek was this utopian, you know, discovering all these places. But mankind grow, is growing into something wonderful. When you look at Avatar, there's no... Mankind digressed. He went backwards. He's taking the minerals of this planet, and he doesn't care who he hurts to take it. He's going to go ahead and get this. And so these peoples, these indigenous people in this planet, are suffering because of it. That is not Walt Disney's vision. That was the wrong IP. Yes, it was a, it's an amazing ride. All the Imagineers did an incredible, oh my goodness, that's pure immersive, it's, it's beautiful. Yes, yes. And that James Cameron's design, that's James Cameron. We got to look at these people closely. We got to evaluate them closely. Think about James Cameron, you're awesome and you've done some wonderful things. Yeah, Terminator 2 was awesome, whatever. But does it fit the Disney model? And it's like, I would have sat there and that, if I was in that room, I would have said, this is a, not a bad idea. But, I mean, well, it's a colorful, beautiful world, but it's not a good idea and it's not a good direction. Unless James Cameron can make another movie that shows a whole different picture of what, how man actually helps these people and they work together and they grow and they do all these amazing things. But Avatar, as beautiful as they did, was the wrong idea because... It's a tragic story. 
It's not a comedy. Cars Land is a comedy. And we can love it and embrace it and have our Cars Land plushies because it's, it's, it's a wonderful comedy. It's a story. And, and boy, and the ride was, oh, yeah, I, I cried too. It's like, this is, glo- this is just beautiful. Avatar takes you into a world that's harsh. Oh, my goodness, this reminds me of the Native Americans. Oh, my goodness, we're stealing their resources. Oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. You see how it lost its magic? Maybe there's some hope for the new one coming out. I hope so. I hope so. I I do hope so. And that would redeem a lot. If if they kind of redirected that and did what I just said about making it something positive, like a positive future, that will redeem it. And that will make a big difference. And then I'll... And then I'll I'll stop whining about it. <laughs> oh yeah, do you want do you want to touch Star Wars? <laughs> well, <laughs> like I, I, uh, once again, a beautiful world, and once again, they really caught the um, uh, the immersion. Uh, but once again, um, Disney did take Star Wars into a different direction that a lot of us weren't used to um, because I, I'm old school Star Wars, but um, the new stories were for the young, you know, to bring in a younger crowd and so they can in- interact better with it. Um, I couldn't relate, but um, that's me because I'm an old guy. But, um, but it was the wrong story. It was the wrong story. And I feel like, it, it, unless, like Sam just mentioned, they could redeem that. Still hope. Thank you, Sam. There is still hope because um, they have to redeem the story. How can you bring Star Wars into our universe and not be disconnected so much? Because Star Wars is a galaxy far, far away and a long time ago, right? How can that be in our part of our world? Uh, How does getting arrested by stormtroopers make you part of the world you want to be part of? It's like, I don't want to be arrested. Um, I never have been. It sounds scary. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know it's all in fun and play. but, But the thing is, People don't want to just shop in an amusement park or be fed. They want to experience. And we mentioned earlier about grandchildren and grandparents is where you start your design. If you start with that purity of heart, when you start where I care about old people and I care about very young people, the the people between, they're pretty tough. They get to take care of themselves. <laughs> well, that, you know what I mean by that. Hey, you've seen a teenager. Yeah, you, you, teenagers are pretty strong. They're smarter than I'm. Um, did you know that? Teenagers are a lot smarter than I am. But anyway, when I took a risk there, I was going to say that the two most important people I care about, I mean, care about all people. Don't get me wrong. I care about all ages. Of course I do. But when you see a child smiling and laughing at something you made or just watching them experience something fun. I mean, your heart is lifting. You talk about crying. I, I, I do cry. I tear up a lot. But I see it because it's based, you know, uh, Brian, it's based on joy. And, and it, it makes your, your joy is welling up. That's what's special to you. So, so crying is cool. Don't worry about that. Anyway, but um, so when I see that, I see a child responding to something wonderful. And I see an old person, an old person who people can, you know, people, our society kind of forgets us sometimes, right? We're old. <laughs> but but they can't ride the fast coasters. They can't, you know, they have the, the pride of a grandparent is sitting their grandchildren on top of their lap. Okay, sitting. They have a grandchild. That is their joy. And But they want to do stuff with them. They don't want to just buy them things. Of course, grandchildren want things. But, but they want to be in that thing where, like that Cars Land, back to that. You can, have, you can be an old person and a grandchild in that because it's not fast. It doesn't jar you around, but you look around and you get to get this big, cool race at the end, but it doesn't lie down. <laughs> it's a perfect ride. It's a perfect design. And that's what I'm looking to. That's what I'm hoping for, to see more at Disney. I, see, I hope Disney will focus in on, on the grandchildren and, 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 the, and the grandparents. And, you know, like I said, Universal's, Universal's uh, age group is probably teenager. A lot of their group, they, you know, they, they like to cater to the teenage, younger people in their 20s um, because of the, they rewrite the rides. Uh, we ride the movies. I'm sorry. We ride, that's, their, that's their slogan. We ride the movies. So um, that's their demographics. So if we remember that, um, and that's fine. 
But you, you go into the park and you're like, oh gosh, Secret Life of Pets is what I worked on. I was in charge of their characters. Um, and that, was de- that is designed for that age group. It's not a fast coaster ride. So basically, we're looking at, um, they're going in the right direction for Universal. So, okay, well, we need to cater more to these, this, to this demographics. Disney needs to do the same. At least that's my opinion. But, um, you know, that's, those are some thoughts I could share with Disney. When I'm in charge of Disney, you watch and see what I do. <laughs> well, we can't wait because we all have those same exact thoughts. And it, it's funny, you actually pretty much just answered the last question that we were going to ask you. And that was, what would you like to see from Imagineering in the future? And you pretty much just answered it. You want to see more heart. You want to see more caring for the the bookends, the kids and the grandparents I like have that. more feeling. Family oh, experience. Mm-hmm. Right. Which goes back to Walt's original vision, building the, the parks in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. Being able Absolutely. to spend more time with his family. Mm-hmm. Absolutely right. I like the expression bookends. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep that. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. This has been absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Where can our listeners find out more about you or connect with you? Well, I, I have a website. It's gilbertlozano.art. Uh, and you can also follow me on Instagram at gilbertlozano. And um, I, I, I do put my latest zoo projects up right now. And um, I, I do have some secret project working on right now that uh, I'm still connected to Disney. Um, in fact, last year I did a little show uh, for Disney. Uh, there was a Mickey Mouse is having, they're having a celebration for Mickey. So Daisy, uh, Pluto, and Chippendale are creating a art show. So in the art show, they all created their own Mickey. And so there's a, Daisy created a topiary Mickey. Chippendale, of course, created acorn Mickey. And Pluto made a dog biscuit, dog bone biscuit um, uh, Mickey. Now, that was wonderful. I got to work for Disney last year, and it was very exciting. And um, I brought that up because uh, I'm still active. I still do Disney stuff when I can. And, and when they need me, I'll definitely jump in there. You can check out the links on where to connect with Gilbert in the description below. Thank you so much again for spending time with us today. Thank you for, for letting me spend uh, so much time with you. I'm very honored and uh, I'm very, I have much gratitude to you guys. You're part of our family now. That's what we're trying to do thank here you. is build a family. Um, so thank, thank you for, you. for being our newest member. Yay. Thank you for including me. Thank you again and take care. We hope that you enjoyed these stories. Be sure to tune in next time and we'll have even more stories from another Walt Disney Imagineer.